Hello, welcome to the Somerville Media Center's panel discussion about food security efforts in Somerville. I'm Julia Taliesin, the reporter and editor for the Somerville Journal, and I'll be moderating the discussion between our four panelists. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, but we're going to get right into this because this is a very important topic. So to our panelists, if you could just give a little wave when I introduce you, that'd be great. Um, so today I am joined by Sherry Green, uh, Director and Operations Manager of the Shepherd's Kitchen Food Pantry, run by Mission Church on Highland Ave in Somerville. Um, we've got David Jacobs, who serves as the Program Manager for Project Soup, which is the food pantry overseen by the Somerville Homeless Coalition. Um, Megan Bouchard, who works in Somerville Public Schools as the School-Based Family and Community Liaisons Program Coordinator. And finally, Lisa Robinson, who wears many hats and is here today in her role as director of the city's Shape Up Somerville program, where she's serving as a food access officer during the pandemic and as an organizer with the Somerville Food Security Coalition. So we've got some very hardworking panelists here with us today. Uh, so Lisa, um, I'm going to start with you, um, but I'd like to welcome all of our panelists to follow up to any of the questions. Um, so Lisa, um, all of the organizations represented here today are a part of the Somerville Food Security Coalition, um, which was, according to the website, formed in 2010, uh, so well before this pandemic has hit us. Um, so how helpful was it to have that network already in place at the onset of this pandemic, kind of when you saw the need rising, and in what ways was the group able to pivot in how they kind of offered aid to the community? Yes. Hi, everybody, and thanks for having us on and have this opportunity just to share what's happening in Somerville around food resources. But yeah, the food, the Somerville Food Security Coalition has been meeting for over a decade and it's been co-led um, throughout that time by Cambridge Health Alliance and the Somerville Homeless Coalition, so the group that David's a part of, um, with the city being you know, a partner in that work. And we've been meeting uh, monthly for a long time. So it was really helpful to have that meeting structure in place and the relationships in place. and. Right when the pandemic hit, we switched to meeting weekly and um, kind of changed our name just to the food action meeting, just so that we were actually taking action. So before we were thinking about more like longer term strategies to addressing food insecurity. And this was, let's get together. Let's make sure, you know, all the players in the room that there's a platform to share out information um, and to bring it back in to get feedback and to make action happen where it's needed. And you can remember earlier on, there was a lot of um, people who were wanting to volunteer, a lot of food donations and a lot of people looking for food. So this was a good place to coordinate quickly because otherwise I think, you know, there'd just be information all over the place. Um, and I'll just say that together, we've really done a lot in terms of food provision, but also in terms of communication, getting the, wor the word out to residents and again, bringing it back in and making sure, sure we're all up to date with the information. Um, and we continue to meet, anyone's welcome. Uh, we meet twice a month. And there's also more information on our website, the Somerville Food Security Coalition. If I may add, um, the fact that Lisa's representing from the city, so the 311 aspect of how citizens would get assistance has been covered by this coalition as well. Um, so David, I actually wanted to ask you something next. So Project Soup, right, is the food pantry of the Somerville Homeless Coalition. Um, and your partner organization, the Greater Boston Food Bank, stated on its website that one in eight people in Eastern Mass is expected to experience food insecurity in 2020 just as a result of COVID-19. So can you talk a little bit about the added challenges that have been brought about by the pandemic based on what you've seen? So the Somerville Homeless Coalition is kind of getting hit both ways um, when it comes to this pandemic because of the lack of employment. It's, it's um, having an effect on people's housing, which then ripples down to their food insecurity. So we've seen a huge growth uh, in demand uh, at the pantry over the last nine months, 10 months now. Um, probably about a 60% growth um, in just those, that short amount of time. And um, including, you know, having to get more food from the Greater Boston Food Bank, as well as distribute it through home deliveries and, you know, more people coming to the pantry itself. So it's been a huge growth, unfortunate growth. <laughs> Got it. And would you say that that like where exactly is that coming from? Is it um, like what's the increase in new new kind of um, 
new people needing this need versus people who have, may have been using these services before? What does that look like? Well, the demographics actually haven't changed percentage-wise very much. Um, we have a lot of Latin X uh, customers. Um, I think that's also a function of where we are in Somerville. That's a very high population area around the pantry. Uh, so I think that's having a, a large effect there. Plus, it's you know the nature of the work that was lost is very blue collar, um, and I think that is affecting uh, this the very similar populations. Thank you. Got it. Um, so Sherry, um, kind of you also work in the food pantry world. Um, so Shepherd's Kitchen is another food pantry operating through the Mission Church of Christ. I'm at Highland Dev. So just looking at your organization's Facebook posts, um, volunteers unload and repack bags of food and then distribute that food throughout the region. So I was just kind of wondering, you know, how how far out are your volunteers going? What what area um, are you serving right now? Um, thank you uh, for having us. Um, so Shepherd's Kitchen, which was initially um, sort of founded and started within the church um, under the umbrella of the church ministry, um, is has really grown over the last three years. And we have been able to, um, through our uh, distribution and, and um, just you know, working within the community um, have really started to branch out to other communities within Boston. Currently right now, um, because of the shutdown, we have had to um, move to deliveries. So right now we're delivering as far as Brockton, we have some in Hudson, um, we have a satellite site, um, in um, Newton that actually deliver, delivers to Boston Public School students. Um, we have a partnership with them. Um, so we're really just wherever there's a need um, and a lot of those referrals are either through um, families within the church that know of families that are struggling with uh, food insecurity and things like that. So we've, we've been able to just branch out pretty far um, because of the delivery component right now, um, just because of some of the guidelines with the, the restrictions in terms of like COVID and, and numbers in our building, we have had to move to the delivery option. Sure. I'm also curious, I know that the pantry has been around longer than the pandemic has. Um, what was it like kind of in those initial days of ramping up operations? Um, and how, how much more work would you say is being done now than most being done before? So when we initially started, we started with just a, you know, we wanted to do, um, you know, just kind of something um, nice for the community. So we did like a Thanksgiving giveaway. And that was primarily um, donations that were from the from within the ministry, um, the church ministry, uh, people donated, um, you know, different items, and we were able to do probably about 30 um, dinners that year um, for just families within the community. And then, you know, we just wanted to move bigger, and we got a um, wrote a proposal to become an actual food pantry. We're connected also with the Greater Boston Food Bank. Um, so the first two years were really awesome in terms of, you know, being able to set up our downstairs. Uh, we have a, a, what we call a fellowship hall, set that up and monthly we would have, you know, a regular distribution um, where we would have, you know, just regular um, in people that came through um, on a regular basis. Um, and that was really uh, amazing. And it was something that always, um, I always say still, it's my favorite Saturday um, or day of the month because it just, it, it's amazing just the impact that we're having um, within the community. And we've worked with Lisa and you know some others. And so it's been really good just to get involved. Uh, so another question I have for you, but I would I would kind of kick it out to everyone is um, kind of what challenges have you um, and your volunteers been seeing uh, kind of in this work? And what do you wish the community knew more about the need that you are seeing? I could start that one off. I um, some of the challenges that we have had are, of course, you know, not being able to get into our building. Another 
um, specific challenges currently right now with not only just like the, the amount of um, the limited amount of pe volunteers that we're able to have, um, there's also construction um, on Highland Ave right on the side of our building where we do unloading and where the um, where our line used to sort of uh, line up to go into the building. The cold weather, of course, and not being able to have that space because for a while when it was nicer, we, we decided, okay, we'll shift and we'll go to the other side of the building and do an outdoor um, lineup. Um, for us, ours is strictly volunteer um, and it's within the church community. Um, so um, funding has always been, you know, just sort of a, a issue for us as well. Um, for a time being when the church was open, we fell under a department within the church. And so we were able to finance a lot of some of our um, needs, financial needs through that, but we've been able to, you know, secure a grant through the city um, and, you know, have done some fundraising during this period of time. So we we're just trying to find creative ways to just be able to maintain the quality of um, food that we were giving because the Greater Boston, although they are a good resource because of the demand, you know, that has even uh, decreased, you know, in what we are able to um, get from them as well. So just being creative, I guess, and trying to find other ways to keep doing what I, doing. I would second that, that the, the food bank has definitely been a great resource, um, but with the demand on that they are facing, the, the quality of some of the produce isn't quite there. Um, they, they just don't have it mostly uh, because of the demand of, of all that they're facing. So that's uh, also a, a challenge for us in, in trying to make sure we get the healthy food out to our guests. Sure, got it, thank you so much. Um, so Megan, um, I'd love to kind of include you in this. So um, I remember uh, reporting early on on how the schools came together pretty quickly to offer grab and go meal options for families. And I remember seeing those numbers early that just thousands of meals were being given out to families. Um, so will you tell me kind of how that's gone, um, what you've learned and kind of what additional support you and your office is making available to families? Sure. Um, well, first, just thanks for having me. And also, there's no way the schools or the city could be doing this work without our community partners. It's just, I like that is one consistent thing. There's not been a lot of consistency throughout this experience since March, but my, the consistent thing for me at least is my thankfulness for all of our community partners because we wouldn't have been able to do this um, without each other um, and having that food security coalition as a, a sort of baseline um, connection and relationships really helped everybody out. But yeah, the, the schools, um, transitioned into originally it was four pickup sites um, in March and, and into April um, and throughout the spring. They were very busy. Um, families coming to pick up breakfasts and lunches. Um, those sites have actually expanded this fall to all pre-K to eight schools are now distributing meals. Um, they distribute roughly like 5,000 meals a week, um, breakfast and lunches to families. Um, We've partnered with folks like Food for Free um, over the summer, as well as last spring, where they were giving out um, grocery bags for families who came to the pickup sites um, on Fridays. It was sort of a, a modified version of, of our weekend backpack program that the team I work with in the schools, the SFLC liaisons, have been um, partnering with Food for Free on for actually quite a few years now. Um, and, and this fall, we've been, ex been able to expand um, by quite a bit. We have generally served around like 250 to 300 students with weekend food um, because of the challenges with, like Sherry was explaining, you know, volunteers and packing food and, and what that entails in this time of COVID. We've actually transitioned to monthly gift card giveaways to families. Um, we're up to over 400 gift cards currently. Um, and that's serving about like 250 something families. Um, it's quite a, 
sort of coordination feat in making sure that families are able to pick up these uh, resources from whatever site or school is closest to them. Um, the liaison team has been doing amazing work with that. Um, but the SFLC liaisons, which is a school-based physician, you know, are part of a much larger network, not only the whole of the SFLC, which is the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative. We run programs for, for all ages. Um, so really it's about this network of relationships and supports for families. And everybody's always talking to each other about who's helping which family and if they have one child in one school, but they have children in another school, are we all talking to each other? Um, our school-based partners, the administration teams, the counselors, the nurses have just been amazing about referring families for any kind of food access supports they need, um, whether it's signing them up for these, this like modified backpack program, having phone conversations with families about how to access you know, community supports, whether it's directions to Project Soup and what are their open hours or you know, how to access you know, Shepherd's Kitchen, um, but also with, with new benefits like uh, the pandemic EBT and families, you know, receiving this letter in the mail and this card and some families were not familiar with it and just walking through families through the process of activating the card, how to use it in local stores, when to check, you know, balances, how to check balances, all of that information has been a huge part of our work since March. Wow, that's incredible. So really just supporting families through Every, every one of these processes, it seems, all yeah. the different avenues available. Wow. Thank you, Megan. Um, so I, I want to kind of kick this out to all of you. Um, you know, you're, you're all, you know, in different ways um, and in your own areas on the ground, you know, really doing this work. Um, so I, I would love to know kind of where, where are you seeing the most need and what does it look like, you know, and what are the roots of this need and kind of in this work, do you think we're missing anyone, you know, is there anything we could be doing better? So what do you have to say on that? Anyone can feel free to start. I think I just want to reiterate what David had mentioned before. Um, the need is much greater than it used to be. That's what we're seeing in the schools, working with families, and it's it's multiple needs. It's um, it's you know folks who are struggling with food also need support and accessing rental assistance, um, and it may also be a family that also needs help supporting their child accessing the remote learning that's happening for their child's school. It's really, I think you mentioned what are some of the challenges, and it's. I mean, it would be great if I could say that food is always the priority, but you know, when families reach us to, out to us about needs, sometimes it's rental assistance first. Sometimes it's, you know, my child can't access the school day today. I need help with that. It's, there's just really so much right now. So yeah, so yeah, staff capacity is, is, can be a challenge too. Everybody's tired. I would add that um, some families actually knowing how to get help is hard. Um, we've had customers come to us and say, oh, I didn't even know this was here. Um, so getting the word out that there is help, um, you know, access to 311 that, that Lisa's providing is, is terrific. Um, so just making sure that people can know what resources are available to them is a challenge. I would also say that, you know, um, echoing what everyone has said, that also, you know, we have the resources for food many ways, but then there's all the other toiletries and cleaning supplies and PPEs and everything that's going to keep people safe is huge. And I think, you know, Sherry and David can speak to this better, but often, you know, grants are there to support buying food, not so much all these other things. And that's where, you know, community support has been huge and people wanting to donate items. And, you know, we have a call out right now for cleaning supplies so that that can go out to families um, to, you know, try to reduce uh, transmission, for example. Yeah, cleaning supplies and toiletries are always the top of our uh, donation list. You know, being newer to this sort of coalition that I feel like Somerville has done a really good job. I know that um, my email is always, full of emails from either the Food Coalition or other resources. So I feel like um, Lisa and her team has done an outstanding job at really connecting us all and making us aware of 
you know, ways that we can be involved. Um, I know that Shepherd's Kitchen is always looking for ways to really be involved. So, you know, um, we're available and here, um, but I think that Somerville has just really done a really good job. So um, shout out to them. Awesome, we love, we love snaps. Um, thank you, um, Lisa, I, I'm just curious um, because, <clears throat> because David's mentioned it a few times, could you just tell us a little bit about how 311 has supported your work in food security? Yes, so 311 is the um, constituent service line through the city. And, you know, if you need help with anything, the idea is you call 311 and there's a team of people pick, you know, picking up the call in various languages, sort of directing your call as needed. Um, so if you have a question specifically about food, right, they'll direct you to our office who then will kind of have a better sense of, you know, the landscape and where to direct that person or who to call um, specifically to help. So, you know, in terms of housing, any housing issues, work issues, anything, you know, and this existed before COVID, right? So anything related to permits, rats, anything. Um, so the idea is it goes to 301, it gets triaged out. And that's something, you know, it's such a good reminder that David is saying that, you know, that that should be your one-stop shopping for help. Very cool. Would you say that um, this line, I mean, I've, you know, I, I've used it myself. Um, <laughs> would, has it been used for kind of food security and support much more since COVID has come about? Like people kind of not knowing exactly where to go, but knowing that they can go here. I, I think so. I, I think, it, you know, we were monitoring it and it seems like, you know, the numbers ticked up around the, you know, the first surge and they're sort of ticking up a little bit again. Um, I think, not everybody is using it though. So I think, you know, people are finding other ways and it's just a good reminder that we could continue to really promote that as a place to go. Absolutely, cool, thank you so much. Um, so I'd love to kind of hear a little bit, you've, you've spoken, you know, all of you a little bit about grants, about finances, about donations. Um, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So I'd love to hear from you kind of about, you know, what, what support you're getting, like whether it's financially through donations, where their donations are coming from and kind of what shortfalls exist in this area and, you know, where do those shortfalls get made up? You know I mean, can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, back again to our partners have just been amazing. Um, we're working very closely um, with Food for Free, which is a Cambridge based organization that works with both Cambridge schools and the Somerville Public Schools. Um, and we are, you know, helping families with this modified backpack program and just taking the turn, um, taking the form of gift cards this year. But we also received an anonymous, anonymous donation um, of emergency gift cards for families um, that is supplemental to this monthly program. And, and it's just been, we've had two instances. I mean, this has only been about a week or two old. Um, and in just those two weeks, we've had two instances of emergencies where a family experienced a flood in their home and, and lost everything. You know, like, like these things happen. and and. Um, luckily, many families are very well connected to the schools in terms of, like David said, sometimes folks don't know where to ask for help, but thankfully we have the relationships with families that um, we can step in and, and, and really be that sort of wraparound support. Um, but we've also, you know, the, the parent teacher associations in our schools have really, um, you know, taken on fundraising specifically for things like emergency funds at their schools. So like I know one liaison today who was working with a staff member and the PTA to figure out supporting a family to pay her cell phone bill, um, which is so incredibly important at this time in terms of just staying connected to the information that is going to support the family and, and um, those students. So the PTAs across the district have really stepped up in terms of fundraising for very specific support. So there, there's just so many initiatives right now. Um, one is just started at the high school between a counselor and, and the staff at um, the Dark Horse, you know, like, like community organizations, restaurants have really stepped in to say, what can we do to help? How can we partner to make it sustainable, which is so incredibly important. Um, and, and what can we do to like make sure families have a little bit more of what they need. Um, especially around the holidays that are coming up. So it's just been awesome. Yeah, I, I would add that we've received some um, grants from the city 
in terms of block grants and things like that. And those are very much related to making sure that my food quantities remain high. Um, the issue I'm seeing is around non-food items, um, such as toiletries and, and as Lisa was mentioning, cleaning supplies. So getting these types of supplies out to our clients is our number one donation request. And um, we've had some corporations that have jumped in with some really generous donations, um, GLX, um, Santana Properties, things like that have really, you know, jumped in and really done some nice donations to us um, of toiletries and cleaning supplies that we've been making sure it gets out the door. So that, that part, the community's really been doing what they can to, to help us out. And that's been great. Um, I would just add to that. We've also received a grant from the city, which was, um, you know, being new, our first grant, um, which has been a little challenging um, just in terms of, you know, because we're, we're strictly volunteer, strictly nonprofit. So it's a reimbursable grant. So it's, you know, just, putting it, we didn't have any money, which is why we applied for the grant, but then you need to, you know, reimburse yourself that money. So it's, it's just been a challenge and we've sort of had to find creative ways to, you know, um, get that money. Um, but we were able to, um, we did get a, a donation, just sort of a, an anonymous donation of gift cards um, and, I just did a, a raising money on um, for Giving Tuesday through like a GoFundMe type thing. Um, so people have been generous in terms of just, you know, um, friends, you know, that believe in, you know, what we're doing, things like that. But that has probably been one of the biggest challenges, just being able to, you know, do some of those things that, you um, require funds. Um, the food is great, like um, David and Megan said, but, you know, just those other needs that people have, like for Thanksgiving, because we weren't necessarily able to have our normal distribution and give out all of the food. We did turkeys and gift cards, um, but being able to get those gift cards cost money, so. And I just want to highlight that all of our uh, food pantries and food organizations in Somerville, if you go to their website, they all have, you know, a button to donate. So anyone watching this, if they wanted to donate, go there, please. Thank you. Exactly. So that's exactly, I was going to kind of wrap, wrap this up. We're coming to the end, but um, you've all been, you mentioned, you know, toiletries, gift cards, you know, cash donations that you have the flexibility to buy whatever you don't have enough of. Um, but kind of what, is there anything more you need? And kind of, can you tell me just a little bit about the best way that the community can help you guys? Well, I'm going to say finance, <laughs> finances, you know, right now, um, that's really, you know, in order for us to still, you know, maintain and be able to supply uh, um, the people that are in need, we, you know, donations um, could really support us. Always. I'd add the Somerville Cares Fund is always in need of more donations. Um, and our partners at the Welcome Project have been amazing as well. But any, any help, please be generous. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your time today um, and continued hard work just to serve our city's vulnerable populations in so many ways. Um, I think, you know, it's important to remember that, you know, as we head into this New England winter <laughs> um, with the second surge underway um, and some real schools still closed, you know, that's still a challenge. Um, this work really remains essential. Um, so I know I really appreciated the opportunity to learn from all of you. Um, I hope our viewers did too. Um, so to, to the viewers, uh, you can stream this video on somervillemediacenter.org. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next time.